Okay. So welcome everybody today on August 27th on the Friday. Thank you for um, taking some time out of your day to listen about Primrose. I am Angela De Palma Dow. I am the Lake County Water Resources Department's Invasive Species Program Coordinator. We're gonna do a quick sound check to make sure everybody can hear okay. You guys can see the screen. It should be the screen that says, all you need to know about creeping yellow water primrose. So if anybody can't see this or anything, raise your hand, do a, let us know. Is everybody good? Okay. Um, we will be recording the meeting today. It's recorded right now because we want to make this available for any folks that are not available right now uh, to be able to tune in. We also want to have this resource available for um, any future uh, learning opportunities for folks. So um, the other thing I'll say is that a lot of this uh, project development for this outreach, um, I'm giving support to this on the spot engagement workshop I attended this year. Um, and this is hosted by the uh, partners at the bottom, the Oregon State University, Institute for Learning Innovation, and the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So they really helped me um, put together outreach materials that'll be useful for this event. And if you haven't already done so, follow us on our Facebook page at Lake County Water. And so this is a little bit of the outline to have the hour broken up. Um, it, it's, it's pretty structured. We're going to get through a lot today. And uh, one thing that I will talk about is um, we're going to have a little intro to Zoom. So you know how to use the Zoom we're using today. You're going to have some interaction opportunities. And then we have a poll at the end. The poll is only about one minute. But it's just so I can get some feedback from you guys how useful this uh, event is. So we do other outreach events. We can use that information. We can make um, better materials and better resources for you guys. Um, so some Zoom reminders. Uh, I will be presenting it and we'll have the Zoom moderated by Daniela. She's another one of our staff here in Water Resources. Um, you guys are all muted by default and your videos um, when you came on were, were off, but feel free to turn them on or off um, as long as we can get through the presentation. If you guys have any questions or um, that you want answers, you can put them in the chat box. Um, and we'll make sure we get to them. We have a special period at the end for question and answer, as well as any other comments or anything particular you want me to know about or address. We are gonna be using this annotate feature. We'll use it right away. So we'll go through it right here pretty soon. Um, and then if there's any links that we wanna share, we'll put them in the chat box as well. And then um, at the end, we'll have that poll. And again, this is gonna be recorded, but we'll put it on our website. And uh, I think we have a YouTube channel and then we'll also put it on Facebook for future reference. Okay, so we're gonna use the annotate here to kind of show you um, or show us where you live. And this is what it's gonna look like is we're getting an idea of where you guys live around the lake. That's what it looks like when the annotate's used. So what we want you to do is you're gonna go to the top of your screen. If you're on a desktop, if you're on a mobile device, we'll have directions for you in a second. So what I want you to do is go to the top of your screen. There should be a little three buttons or three dots, or it should say more options. And you wanna click on that and then you'll look at the list and there'll be a little option for annotate and you wanna find that. When you get that, click on the annotate, there should be a little bar that'll have some tools for you. And you just wanna pick a stamp or a pen or any of those tools in there and then make a mark on the map for where you live. So I live um, in, like Kelseyville around here. So that's where I'm putting my, my mark right here. I don't live on the lake, not yet, working towards that. Great, so Danielle's got there. If you have a phone, what you wanna do is make sure that your phone is turned, your um, screen is full screen and it's sideways. And you're gonna see a little icon on the corner that looks like a little pen. So it's a little pen icon, you can click on that and that'll let you do the annotate. So we're just trying to get an idea of where people live here. And I'll give us a minute to do that. Yay, yep, I see we got some keys folks in there. Thank you, Daniela. She put the Facebook uh, page in our chat. I appreciate that. Good, so we're just annotating where we are. We get an idea of their audience here. See how many of us live on the lake and who might be dealing with um, Primrose right now. I'll get to your question, Donna, a little bit. Great, is there anybody that can't find the annotate and needs a little help? 
Yes. <laughs> okay, so are you on a desktop, sir? Trying to unmute you here. Okay, if you're on a desktop, this is where you wanna be on the desktop for the annotate. So up at the top, you're gonna to move your mouse up to the top of the screen and there'll be a little drop down bar. There's gonna be three little dots or it might say more and that's what you wanna look for. If you can't find it, you can always kind of put the general area in the chat box and we'll put it on there for you. So on the top, it says you are viewing Angela's screen. And then right next to it, it says view options. If you click view options, it should come up, annotate. Thanks for that, Daniela. We got a Spring Valley maybe? Is that where that little blue arrow is? Let's give it like one more minute and then we'll move on. This is good though. Okay, it's somebody in the rib, so I'm gonna do a little X over here. Does that look good with a Riviera person? Good. We got some doodlers, that's fine. <laughs> Robert Sullivan, you have a question? You're raising your hand? Let's get you unmuted. Okay, now I can hear you. I'm trying to put my location mark and it's not doing it. Do you have a stamp or a drawing? You can try a different option too. The stamp I like works well. So some people had some for the keys. You can always tell me where it is, I'll plop it. Uh, Kono Tehi in Lucerne. That's like right there, right? The green check. All right. Good. Okay. So I think we got a good idea of where we are. I'm going to save this. I'm going to put you on mute, Bob. There you go. Good work. Okay. So I have this saved. So we'll have that. Um, oh, yeah. Cash Creek is over there. Perfect. I didn't put any of the river. I don't want to leave out somebody's uh, creek or stream. So I just didn't put anything on there. Thank you guys so much. Um, I am going to, that actually was not my annotate, go to the next slide. Thank you. That really helps me put in perspective what the audience um, is today, like where you guys are from, what you um, are thinking about. I'm really excited that some folks that don't necessarily live on the lake are still here to learn about Primrose. So um, thank you so much. All right. So whoop, I have to clear my annotate first. Clear all drawings. There we go. So the first thing I'm going to dive into is what an invasive species is. So this is the definition by the US EPA. So invasive species is one that's not native and whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. Now we think of invasive species, this is something that comes up a lot, especially we live on Clear Lake. These are quagga mussels and they've totally infested this dam infrastructure on the Colorado River. So this is what we think of when we think of invasive species right away. Um, they had to remove this big piece of structure. They have to clean it off. It's gonna cost a lot of money. They probably have to do this about three or four times a year. This also could um, damage the integrity of the dam or jeopardize the integrity of the dam and what that dam function is. So these things um, all contribute to the definition of invasive species, particularly when you're looking at economic harm, harm to human health, um, and so keep that definition in mind. We're gonna be talking about the creeping water primrose today, um, which isn't necessarily defined as invasive species, but it does have some of these, um, uh, does have some of these causes. So it does cause some economic harm to us and it might cause some human health issues. So keep that in mind as we're working through this presentation for with the official definition of invasive species. And then why do we care here on Clear Lake? Well, we want to be able to use Clear Lake. We use it as a drinking water resource. We use it as a recreation source. We use it as tourism to generate revenue for our county, right? And we have areas like this. Some of you guys are from the Keys. You recognize this photo. This is earlier in the year, of course. We had more water over there in the channels. But this is causing issue for you guys over there in these channels, in the Keys, other places around the lake. You have this creeping primrose. It's encroaching on area, open water that you need for boating. 
access as well as um, navigation. So this is why we care here. There's a plethora of reasons, um, but what we really want the state of our lake is here on the left and creeping water primrose is um, adding to what we see here on the right. There's also, you know, these impacts, these ecological impacts, particularly for desirable and beneficial species. So this is a cove over here in Lakeport, and this is all creeping water primrose. This is a more recent photo, so there's no water in this cove right now, but you guys can see the tulies over here on the right. These are beneficial species. These tulies help, they provide a valuable service to the lake. They really improve lake water quality. Right now, in this photo, we can see they're totally surrounded by this primrose. They're looking a little stressed. Of course, it's dry right now. They're not getting the water that they need. It's really hot. And then you have this really strong, aggressive, invasive plant here, this primrose that's just encroaching on them and waiting to take over that space. And this is also true when we think of fish species, right? Um, if this cove had open water, uh, you know, it'd be a great place for fish, juvenile fish to rear, um, maybe some spawning. However, when you have this primrose completely growing within this cove, even if there's water there, it's not really accessible for, for fish. Some general impacts on the ecosystem from um, creeping water primrose we talked about, but they can outcompete other native shoreline plants. They create these dense, thick mats like we just saw in that other photo. They can actually restrict water flow. So if you have a channel that you need that water to be moving through to keep the um, uh, you know, oxygen in there for fish, or you need that water flow to keep the algae out, uh, the primrose really restricts that flow movement, as well as just restricting access to open water. If you're trying to kayak, it, has anybody tried to kayak through a big mat of primrose? It's really difficult, it takes a lot of work, you get tired. Um, we'll also have some examples where it chokes irrigation intakes and, and channels, um, and then, Here's the human health aspect, uh, impact. So uh, the dense primrose, like we saw in the previous photos, and we're gonna see throughout this talk, create the stagnant water that is prime habitat for mosquitoes. And when you have a lot of mosquitoes in an area, you the chances for having uh, mosquitoes that carry West Nile virus increases. And the mosquitoes that carry West Nile virus really, really like that habitat where there's a lot of primrose. So we're working with vector control to do tracking um, on where West Nile habitat is and trying to manage those areas first that have primrose um, in them because of that human health um, impact. If we look at this photo on the right, um, and if uh, you know, there's a column in the Lake County News, the Lady of the Lake that I write, and I use this photo because it shows you the primrose, the invasive here. It also shows you some native smartweed growing as well as some native tule. And then this is a Zola, which is floating mosquito fern. It's, it's very small. It looks kind of velvety. We have all of this, um, these different plants here in this ecosystem and the primrose will come in and you can see it on some of these channels in the lake where it just slowly every year gets bigger and bigger and just chokes out all of these other species and just becomes this um, solid mat and monoculture of uh, primrose. But this is the kind of area habitat that primrose really likes that also has some other native beneficial species growing in it. So here's one of those um, examples, really dense mat here. This is a water intake. This is at uh, County Park, Lakeside County Park. Um, and what happens is they use this intake in this canal here to water all their grass. Um, and you know when they're doing their uh, plantings, they water plants there um, and they couldn't get the water out of the channel because the primrose is just encroaching on that intake. Um, and so they needed some management of that primrose. And then here again, we're talking about boating. Really hard to get your boat in, get your kayak in, if the boat channel looks like this with that primrose. And then of course, we rely a lot on these fishing dollars. So both residents and non-residents spend a lot of money here because they can fish the water and there's productive fisheries. Um, however, if we have invasive plants in our lake and they aren't managed and they grow and grow, we can get water like this. So, you know, it'd be very hard to go fishing in this water, even though we know plants are a great habitat for fish. When there's too much and it takes up too much space, there's actually no habitat there for fish. And we can see that impact our fishery here. This isn't primrose here, it's just an example of other invasive plants that have um, turned successful fishing ponds and lakes into um, basically unusable spaces. And then the Primrose comes in and it fills this niche that we really need to have filled by native species that have evolved to, to be here and um, create these ecosystems that are really beneficial 
um, and serve the uses that both we need, but also the, the lake relies on. So here's an example, um, and I've been able to do this with the primrose this year because it's been so dry, but just walking through this thick primrose, so see how dense that is, that primrose is. Um, and comparison to here, this is a spot in Big Valley, I was kayaking through the Big Valley marsh area. This is native aquatic smartweed. So look at the difference between the way the smartweed grows. Can you guys see it's, it's spaced out more? The uh, smartweed doesn't creep, it grows straight out of the water. So it has all the space. It's great for fish to swim among the smartweed. You could still get sunlight, you can still get, um, uh, you know, some of that beneficial green algae growth, which is for the fish, uh, the fish food that we rely on. You can also have spawning beds in here. Great place to go fishing. There's also still flow. You guys can see open water. We can kind of see through the water a little bit. There's still that flow. You can get oxygen through there um, and water movement. So you can get that, um, that beneficial habitat there for so many um, species. And the primrose can come into areas like this and completely switch it out from something like beneficial smartweed to this really heavy, thick, dense uh, primrose. And then there are evidence of property values declining when there's invasive species present, particularly for lakefront properties. So um, this is, if you live um, along the shoreline of uh, Lakeport here, this is very familiar to you. So this is a dock where boaters during normal years when there's water can get in, access their boat, go out, you know, you guys work hard, everybody works hard. We wanna have a nice place we can go to, we can enjoy the lake. Um, and if you invest in a property and it looks like this, you can't use it, it really diminishes the, uh, um, the ability and enjoyment and the value of that property. Now, there haven't been specific studies done with primrose and property values, but there have been studies done on other invasive plant species for lakefront properties. So this is an example of data from one of those studies that was conducted with Eurasian milfoil. So Eurasian milfoil really gets thick mats um, and grows thick, but underneath the surface of the water. So it does all the same things Primrose does, except it's all submerged in the water and can um, heavily infest a whole lake. And so property values, when they classified lakes with different coverage of Primrose, so lakes that had a six rating, which is a high rating, rating of Primrose coverage, versus one rating, primo, or I mean, Eurasian milfoil coverage, the property values significantly went down. And this is based on, um, I believe, Wisconsin Lake study from 2010. So we have seen other studies and other data collected that property values decline when there's invasive plants um, infestation in, in the lake of that lakeshore uh, property. Nothing's been done yet on primrose, but I would bet there'd be similar um, patterns there. And then the last thing is that there could be impacts beyond available management and control. So if we're not controlling an invasive and it's very aggressive and it keeps growing and growing, it might get to the point where there is literally nothing that can be done that would be able to manage or control it. And then you're basically left with a resource that's not valuable. Um, you know, this plant species uh, is not on a state watch list. The state only comes in and manages it if it's impacting their agriculture um, or something that's of, you know, of um, their special interest, like they came into the lake to manage hydrilla, which they didn't want to go down Cash Creek and infiltrate the um, agriculture channels that come from the Cash Creek that flow from Clear Lake. Um, but there have been situations um, that invasive species have gotten out of control so much that they have basically um, reduced that resource to, um, not have any use. And this happens a lot in Florida. There are hydrilla lakes in Florida that are just covered with hydrilla and they're closed lakes. Nobody can fish, nobody can swim. They can't be used because they're just full of hydrilla. Um, and so as we're thinking about primrose and um, as I work for the county, this is one of my jobs is to think about how we can manage the species so we don't ever get to this point. So just a little thing to think I think about, you know, at night. Okay, we're gonna jump into primrose identification here. Um, and there's some different things to look for for primrose. You know, it's got this really pretty showy yellow flower, but some of the leaves look a little bit different. Here you have their pointed, this real um, rosette has them round. Um, and so we're just gonna go through some of the things to help you identify primrose. Um, so what I have here is a little pictorial. This is the surface of the water. Here's our primrose growing. Um, and we talk about invasive uh, aquatic plants, which is the category of primrose. 
They really don't look like any other invasive plants that we manage here actively on Clear Lake, particularly because they grow above the water um, and everything else that we're actively managing is growing below the water here. So they're not like other invasive plants. And so the most common invasive plants that we have here are these two on the left, Sago pondweed, that's Duginia pectinata. Um, you see that all over, it's very stringy, it's grass-like. That's what the greaves use to make their nests. I'm sure you've seen some of those nests out there on the lake. Greaves love the sago pondweed. It's great fish habitat, but it's also the first thing that gets stuck into your boat motor when you're going out on the lake. The next common invasive we have is this curly leaf pondweed. Uh, we don't see that much right now at this time of year. It's really common first thing in the spring. It comes up in um, uh, May, June. It kind of dies off in July, August. It's one of the first things that we see it pops up and then it's everywhere. And then it goes away in the um, middle of the summer to fall. We do have some Eurasian milfoil on the lake. Um, however, we didn't find any this year because of the drought. Eurasian milfoil likes the, um, it, the patches that we have on the lake are in the sh uh, very shallow areas of the lake. Um, and with this drought, I think it got mostly cut off, but we'll survey it next year and see. But all of those grow under the surface of the water. When we talk about primrose, there's two species that we're mostly focusing on, the peploides and the hexapellata, and I'll have some examples of those in a second. And then we classify primrose, they definitely are a nuisance weed, um, but they've been labeled as invasive. They're also labeled as native but naturalized, so not a native from here, but it's basically they've been here so long, they're naturalized, they're, they're naturalized, they're part of the community. Um, you know, they're just, in, in some areas they are, they're not aggressive, they don't get out of control, um, and so they're considered naturalized. Um, but they definitely are a nuisance <laughs> for both of those. They could be nuisance, and especially in systems like, like their lake, with a lot of shoreline. So again, very unique, one of a kind. Here's um, some examples. So we're at a dock and you can see, I'm sure you recognize places around the lake like this. And if you have it, next time you go to the lake, you'll probably see the primrose. It looks like this on the left versus some of those aquatic species, the submerged species on the right. So here we have some submerged sago pondweed and curly leaf here completely under the surface of the water. So you guys can see the difference between those two and how they grow. Um, some of uh, the characteristics, and this is a great way if you have a plant that you don't know what it is and you want me to give you an ID, put it on your hand and send me a photo from your phone. And that's a great way for me to be able to get an ID because I can get scale. I can see the way the branches are. I can see if there's any flowers, um, what the stem looks like. So these leaves, they're called lancelet. So they're kind of sword shaped, they're pointed at the end. Um, they only ever get about an inch wide. However, some leaves can be round or egg shaped. Like I had the photo earlier, they can be kind of round. It's still the same plant. Um, the round ones are the ones usually you see floating on the water though, right? If you're round, you're going to be able to float better than if you're, if you're long and skinny. Um, and they're alternate with petiole. So the leaves have a little stem that connects to the main stem, um, an alternate fashion like that. And you see these stems are kind of hairy. However, the leaves are very smooth on the surface. Flowers, very easily identify these flowers. They're bright yellow. They'll sometimes have five petals, six petals. They have this little buttercup shape. They're very pretty. It's probably how it got spread around because people liked it. It looked pretty, um, but it does bloom for most of the year. So we can see blooms as early as May and um, it can bloom all the way through December, um, particularly if it doesn't get too cold or we don't get a lot of rain um, or flooding, we can have blooms pretty late into the fall. Um, and then here's some ID resources. So this is Cal Flora. And you guys here, they call it um, the Ludwigia peploides. And then there's some varieties of its subspecies here. Um, and here's one peploides that they're calling native. Here's another one they're calling non-native. And here's one they're calling invasive non-native, right? So how are we supposed to tease all these out? It's nomenclature can be kind of confusing and we don't key or identify every single primrose that we come across on the lake. There are some native primroses, however, like this really cute kind of, they're smaller leaves, they're a little red. Um, there's a couple patches I've seen around, but by far they're not as aggressive as the creeping water yellow primrose that we see in majority. This is another resource. So this is the Jepson manual. So this is from UC Berkeley. Um, and they have some characteristics of, you know, break down what the um, Hexta pilata looks like versus the, um, Palustris, which is one of the native varieties, and the peploides. Um, and then here, 
I just want you to notice they list all these species. They don't refer to any of them as invasive. They refer to all of them as naturalized, meaning um, according to their records, they've been here for so long, they're part of the community, they're just naturalized into the community. And they do have at uh, Berkeley Herbarium, they do have some specimens that have been collected here in Clear Lake since the 50s and the 60s, um, 1950s, 1960s. So um, according to them, it's been here, it's been present. Um, there's probably some things happening with our lake and, and temperatures that are allowing it to grow um, and, and take over a lot more than maybe it was for um, many decades here. Okay, so now we're getting into some of the management and control that we have. So currently on Clear Lake, we have a Clear Lake Integrated Aquatic Plant Management Program, and I refer to it as APM, Aquatic Plant Management. And we have that program, which allows us at the county to both apply herbicides and approve use of herbicides on the lake. We're also allowed to conduct and approve any manual removal, any activities that physically remove these aquatic plants from the lake bed. Before this program, it really was the wild, wild west, all right? People were out there doing whatever they wanted. They were dumping just chemicals wherever. They were hiring people that didn't have licenses. They were mowing, they were tractoring. There was a lot of impacts that were happening on the lake that we had no idea what was going on. You also didn't know if it was the best treatment, if it actually was being effective. So someone's getting their drinking water from the lake. The neighbor is just dumping chemicals in there to try to get you know, some invasive out of, out of their, um, uh, their property. And we had no idea what those impacts are. Um, so the fact that we have this program now where we can track and we can monitor, and yes, we can regulate certain activities to make sure everything is safe and useful and that we know what's going on, especially to prevent any uh, mishaps. We are in the process of developing a primrose um, specific management plan. I wanna tackle this plant on a lake-wide basis. It is very time consuming. There's a lot of research we gotta dig through. We're conducting some research ourselves. Um, having these drought and flood events every few years, as well as fires, doesn't help what we're doing, right? It just adds more complexity to what we're doing um, and more unknown. So it is going to take a while for us to get a plan together um, that'll effectively control, manage, hopefully eradicate primrose around the lake. And then on top of that, we don't have any specific funding to do that plan. So it's whenever I find time um, or we can try to find some grants to pay for it. Um, so it, those are some things that are uh, in the works for managing that. Um, we do have private management. So every year we do have parcels, property owners that can apply for permits and get some treatment and they are managing primrose on their own shoreline. Um, and we encourage that because, you know, it's small parcel by parcel. It's easy to track and the impact is minimum, but it's still um, removing, effectively removing primrose. And then we currently have some experimental projects going and I'm gonna show you some of those soon. Um, but of course, anytime we as the county try to remove large amounts of invasives, we always wanna come in afterwards and do some native plantings. Um, if you just remove invasives from a space, it's available space, guess what? Another invasive is gonna come in and, and fill it in unless you put in some natives there. So I'm gonna talk um, about the three types of treatments, the herbicide, the manual removal, and then we'll talk about some experiments going on. So we're gonna talk about the herbicide treatment first. Now, this is an example of um, uh, one of our contractors doing some herbicide treatments in Dutch Harbor, which is out here by Lakeport. I don't know if you're familiar with this area, but this is a nice little protected cove. It's right by Natural High. Boaters love to go out fishing, go out boating, come into this little harbor, um, you know, anchor their boat, hook up their boat, get off, and then they can enjoy downtown Lakeport. They can come back, they can go out, they have a protected spot. Um, but not when it looks like this, we have primrose in there. Um, so this was one year where the primrose was particularly really bad and we tried to get our contractors going to see what is an effective herbicide treatment for this level of infestation here. Um, and so you see they're wearing their PPE, they're going very slow with their airboat. Look at how dense that primrose is. That's like two feet of thick primrose plus you have the water there and they're just trying to get a handle on it. When we treat primrose, this is the herbicide that's commonly used, that's been used since I've been here managing this program. Um, so it's called triclopyr and it's the brand name is Renovate um, and it's a salt form. And this is what's used in apl um, aquatic applications. There's two other chemical forms, but they're very different. So I'm just gonna 
people always ask me about herbicides, like, oh, you guys use herbicides in the lake. Is that a good idea? And I'm going to go through some of those things right here to give you some um, information about uh, the actual chemical um, used for treating primrose. So it's a systemic. So that means it's absorbed into the plant um, and into the roots. So you can just spray the top of the leaves and as the plant's growing, it sucks it in. And what happens is that herbicide disrupts cell production and the plant basically overgrows itself. It just tries to grow really fast and just overgrows itself and then dies. Um, the actual chemical triclopyr uh, dissolves very easily. So when it mixes with water, it's only effective for a little bit and then it dilutes, it dissolves um, and it's not as effective. Now, when it's in the sun, it's even, it breaks down pretty quickly. So it has a half-life half in the sun for about a day. So when we look back at that picture before, here they're spraying it. They're not spraying it in the water, so we don't have to worry about dissolving in the water. They're spraying it on the primrose, but it only has about a day for it to be effective enough to get absorbed and to impact that plant. And, but you do need that direct contact, so you have to spray it right on the plant. So if there's any wind, if there's any rain, if there's anything like that, they don't spray it because it won't work. Now it's unable to be classified as to human carcinogenity. So what that means, I looked at the studies, they can't connect um, treatments of triclopyr to any cancer cases. It's just not significant. There just wasn't the, um, the causation that this was leading to any cancer development in their, their lab studies. It is not toxic to fish. It can be slightly toxic to birds, but particularly just in looking in the eggshells. So, you know, if you know that you have an area of primrose and you have a really heavy bird population and they're nesting in the primrose and they're using it for that, you know, you want to consider if you want a treatment on it, you have to consider that and let your applicator know and they can treat it when there's not birds using that area. I have not seen birds using the primrose as nesting grounds. I see them use the primrose after treatments have gone into effect. So we were looking at a treatment that was done by a big valley um, by Canocti Vista Casino. And they had some treatments, the primrose died, and I saw a bunch of bird using the primrose after it was treated. Because there's more open space, they can get to fish and food. And there's no evidence of toxicity to bees, however, it's only short-term um, data is available. But also remember that this chemical breaks down really fast, so there's just not enough left to do these long-term accumulative studies on the bees when it's used in sunlight on the plants and not in water. And I will say though that primrose is a pollinator favorite, However, we do have a lot of natives that pollinators like. So if we get rid of primrose in an area and we replant and fill it in with natives, you'll still have some pollinator, um, you'll still have some stuff there for pollinators to be happy with. And these are all my references because people always want to know when it's chemicals, what are your references? Where are you getting this information? And this is where I'm getting it from. So um, if you wanted to know, I'll have that available for you. So this example of some herbicide treatments and some of you folks that live in the Keys, you might recognize this from a few years ago. So they, Vector Control had found um, uh, West Nile uh, positive mosquitoes here in this channel in the primrose beds. So we wanted to go through right away and treat it and get rid of that primrose so we wouldn't have those mosquitoes just breeding like crazy there. So this is what it, what it looks like, you know, about, um, uh, I'd say two or three weeks after treatment. So there's still biomass there but it's not living growing primrose. And the idea is that it absorbed in all that herbicide. And so less of it's viable to grow back next year. Here's another example. This is near um, Clark's Island, which if you look at it today, looks a lot different, but same thing. There's still some biomass there. You still really can't access the water and use the water, um, but you do have this um, uh, you know, reduction in the primrose um, viability here. And last one, this is the Dutch Harbor that I showed you guys before. So this is before the treatment in that area and this is after the treatment. So you can see some areas um, that they got, some areas they actually were, it was too thick. They couldn't get their airboat in. Um, and then you could see there's a lot more open water and space there. And if you are thinking about doing treatments this year is the time to do that. Um, if you guys see here, this is what our shoreline looks like. I'm sure you're familiar. The water is very far away from where the plants are. This is a great time to do treatments. Uh, you may know primrose will still be blooming and growing until um, at least October, the end of October. 
Um, there's not water there, so you don't have to worry about any herbicides getting into the water. The plant is probably pretty stressed. It's dry. Um, it looks like it's growing healthy, but it's probably very easy to do an herbicide treatment and get it knocked down because um, it's probably pretty stressed. There's not a lot of moisture there for it. Um, also, we do have some contractors and I'll give you their information here, but they are ready to do um, any herbicide treatments around the lake as needed um, uh, in the next month or so, which it would still be effective. Okay, next on removing the manual removal. Let's say you have a smaller property, a smaller parcel, um, or there's a little patch of primrose, you don't wanna do herbicides. Um, so maybe you're thinking about manual removal. Um, which is very effective if it's maintained. So there's a property here in Lakeport and they've been doing some manual pulling um, every year for about five years. It doesn't take a whole lot if you keep it up um, and their place looks great. They have some weeds growing there, but they're all terrestrial and they don't have any primrose. The, um, so I mean by terrestrial is they came in this year because of the drought, there's no water. They're gonna go away. They won't grow when there's water there, but they don't have primrose because they've been removing it every year. It is time consuming, however. So, um, you know, you do have to go out and you, it's just like pulling weeds in your garden, right? If you have a garden with vegetables, you gotta go out and, and pull up the weeds. So it's great for small areas, especially if it's you doing the manual removal or say you hire your gardener to help you do it or you have a son who has to work off his allowance. Any of those options would be great um, for these smaller areas. We have found that this is not effective when there's low water or dry soil. You cannot pull out those roots. So here's an example. Um, so we removed this primrose here in, in the water. We tried to remove it up here in the dry areas. And guess what? A week later, look what it looked like. And actually two weeks later, this is what it looked like. It grew right back where it's dry. Not in the water, I mean, because it has to creep out there, but it does in the dry soil. It was really hard to get those roots. So it's most effective in the aquatic zone. Also, one thing to keep in mind when you're removing anything is you don't want to pull up any baby fish. Um, even though it's invasive, some baby fish like, especially this little area out here in the water, particularly baby hitch. So here's an example. These hitch can be pretty small. Um, so when you are pulling, just make noise, splash around, move the plants, get those fish to scatter. Um, they might not scatter if you're just pulling stuff up. They might freeze and then they'll get pulled up and then thrown in the garbage bag or the compost. I mean, we don't want to do that. So here's an example of us doing some manual removal treatments. Here is our uh, coordinator, Will, pulling up. Again, there's dry land. Look at all that sediment on soil pulling up with those roots. Here's what it looked like before. And then here's what it looked like after. And these are, we tried to plant some um, sedges here um, uh, into place to kind of take over instead of primrose. But this kind of all grew back. So it, it wasn't the, it worked for a little bit, but it's not as effective as it is if it was in a aquatic zone. Um, we do have some private residents that do their own removal and they look, it looks great. So here's an example. Um, they're, they have primrose on this, you know, they have some in the aquatic zone. They also have some on this little, um, the incline here, it's pretty rocky. They pulled out all of this and every year they go and they remove the little spots that come up. And this is what their property looks like. And it's great. They can access their dock. Uh, they don't have any primrose here. Um, and so we really encourage, you know, individuals that want to get rid of the primrose um, can do that. You can hire somebody to do a lot of this the first year, and then you can do your own maintenance the next few years. So there is a diver that works around the lake and he will do some manual removal, particularly in the aquatic zones. So this is what we did. The county, the parks department hired this diver to remove this, um, uh, it was like an eight foot uh, radius around this water intake at Lakeside County Park. And you can see it worked. The rest of the summer, Primrose wasn't around this um, circle. There was some duckweed that was able to get in there, which is fine. It sits on the surface um, and the ducks like it and the fish like it, the duckweed's fine. It's, it's totally um, native and, and good for the water. Um, but this primrose couldn't crouch on that or it could have crawled in, but he did a good job of removing it. And that intake then was able to function the rest of the summer for the park. So questions about permit. And I see there's a question about how much of the permits and treatments by the company. Um, so I'm gonna talk about that right now. So when you, if you wanna get information on the permits, you wanna to go to our website and then you click on programs and projects and you'll see this list of everything that we do. And you wanna just hover over aquatic plant management. And then this is all the options for that. If you just click on aquatic plant management, that's fine. That'll take you to our homepage. 
And there's a link there that goes to the 2021 Clear Lake Aquatic Plant Management Permit, permit Application. It's only one page front and back, um, and you enter in your APN, your name, the address, what you, the treatment is for, and then what species you're treating. If you don't know what species it is, you can send me a photo or photos, and I can tell you, um, and I can even check it off for you. Um, and then if you wanted to do a manual removal, that's right here under mechanical. And let's say you're doing an aquatic plant treatment or your contractor is. Um, homeowners that don't have a license can't do uh, uh, spray treatments. And then you just, they would just check which herbicide they're gonna use. This is all part of our tracking. And then there's some things where you sign. The main thing about primrose is that we wanna know where you're putting the material. So we don't want you to just pull all the primrose and put it on your neighbor's property and it can go back in the lake. That's not allowed. You wanna put it in your compost or make sure it goes out into the green waste um, or goes you know, onto your, in your vegetable garden or something away from the water and not uh, impact somebody else. There's some other things in here too about um, making sure that, you know, when you're pulling it, you're making noise so you don't pick up fish by accident. And that's a requirement from the state. The state wants to make sure that we're not allowing people to pick up fish by accident. So why do we need a permit? I know people don't like permits, it's paperwork, it's bureaucracy, it takes time, I, I know. Um, but we have to report to the state what we're doing in the lake. And this is the best way for us to do that tracking. Um, we have to do these annual reports every year after our annual report. And I have to say, this is what we did in the lake that year. So for herbicide permits, we have to make sure the chemicals being used are legal. California is very strict. They don't just let any chemical be used, especially in waterways that are drinking water sources. So I wanna make sure the chemicals that are being used are legal and that are being used in the right amounts that's not gonna cause any problems. Um, and we also wanna avoid negative interaction. So if there's a big event going out on, you know, like we have the seaplane event or the boat races, I don't want people treating around those areas that weekend because that stuff's just gonna go everywhere. It's not gonna be effective. For manual permits, um, the process of moving or pulling can sometimes move sediment, which has nutrients that can cause algae blooms. There also could be maybe some um, sensitive species using the area for nesting or spawning. So we just wanna know where people are doing this pulling activity, this manual activity. Um, so we can make sure if there's anything going on in the lake, we can rule this out as potential reasons, or it might be reasons and then we could do some different management or manage better. It's all about tracking and knowing what's going on. So that's what your permit fees are for. We're not making any money on this. We actually lose money. Um, so the money that we do take for permits is just for us to do the tracking and do the reporting so we can actually manage this lake like we're supposed to. And that's our job as lake caretaker. So the State Land Commission of California gave us Lake County Water Resources the job of making sure the lake is cared for. So part of that is tracking what we're doing, who's doing the work, and making sure there's no negative impacts. And if we don't do that, the state can take the lake away from us. <laughs> I don't think that'll happen, but the last thing we need for permit, again, is tracking. I like to see where this is a idea. It gives you an idea of where all the um, treatments are occurring. So we have orange is our chemical treatments, yellow are the mechanical or pull treatments. Um, we like to keep track of the um, herbicides used. You know, in one year, somebody had a permit for Roundup or for glyphosate, but they never actually used it. They just pulled the permit in case they needed to. And then we do a lot of water quality monitoring. So we wanna make sure that um, the chemicals that are going in the lake aren't having an impact. So I go out and I monitor the concentrations um, after treatments. And so we report all of that in our um, reports and it's all part of the permit process or what the permits um, help us do. So if you want a permit for herbicide treatment, you do need to go to a licensed applicator. On our website, there's a page that says licensed applicators, and this is exactly what it looks like, and it's updated every single year. So there's two companies right now that do work on the lake. This is Clean Lakes. Um, their technician is named Drew, and Waterworks, their technician is named Ari. Um, and I just talked to them yesterday and this morning, um, and they're ready to go. If anybody has questions about applications or primrose treatments, they're ready, they're able to come up, they're able to answer those questions. Um, I know the lake is far away from the shoreline. They can walk in, they have a cord from their truck, they have backpack sprayers, um, and they are available right now um, to answer any questions for that. Uh, we also have um, a mechanical dive service. So this is uh, Frank from Bullfrog. I don't know if anybody's had him before out there. He does a really good job of pulling um, for smaller parcels, 
when the plants are in the water still, when there's a lot of water, it's really hard to pull. He won't do dry land stuff, but he'll do in the water. And he does a really good job because he's a diver and he enjoys it and he'll, he'll pull them up. The main thing to know is that these guys um, are licensed applicators and they're approved um, for your permits because they are trained in both application and safety. Currently, these harvester machines are not allowed on Clear Lake unless you have a special permit with the state. Um, and so you have to go through a state process, which I can help facilitate that if anybody wants a harvester. So our last few slides are gonna talk about the efforts and experiments that the county is doing right now to figure out some primrose management. Um, and if you live near the Keys um, or the Oaks, you might've seen some of this. So this is an example of our phase one. Um, it doesn't look like this over there anymore on Clark's Island, obviously, because there's no water. Um, but these are some of our experimental plots that we had out there. And this is one of them, it's a solarization. So it's this plastic that we, um, we weed whacked and then we laid all this plastic down and we let it sit for five weeks in the sun. Um, and we wanted to see if this was an effective way of managing primrose. The most important thing about this is we only put it in areas where it was 100% primrose. We didn't wanna get rid of any natives that might've been there. So where there's patches where it's half primrose has something else, we did not use this. Um, we want to just get primrose, nothing else. We did have a lot of partners for this. We couldn't have done it alone. So the County Department of Agriculture helped fund a lot of this work. We worked with our partners at the Tribal Eco Restoration Alliance. This is some of the folks there. There's a lot of man hours, a lot of labor to do this. Um, Robinson Rancheria, Big Valley Rancheria helped us with water quality monitoring. Um, Kenny, Kenny Environmental with that as well. And then County Parks, because it's Clark's Island, they help with some um, uh, pickup service there. Um, so you can see, I mean, this is a smaller solarization project right here, but it takes a lot of us staff with the tires, laying it out, making sure the area is prepped properly. And some of the results for this, um, you can see this was after the first week or first five weeks. Here, this plot on the left, and we just moved it over. And this is a close up, and you can see the difference between the living primrose here and that dead primrose. And we kind of dug into the soil and it's the top six inches. It's almost like at, it's just, they're just, it just got so hot from that solarization fabric, just broke it up. Um, and we're monitoring it to make sure there's no sprouts, right? This treatment won't work if we get sprouts coming back almost immediately in that area that we treated. And we were really excited because this makes room for natives and beneficial species. So this was our edge of our solarization. And we put it right up to the edge of this native smartweed, this beneficial shoreline here. Um, that looks very similar to primrose, but it grows differently. Um, and so you can see we had the plastic. You can see that primrose just got scorched. And this uh, smartweed was able to grow all the way up. And then we're hoping it'll just take over this area where the primrose was and just fill in. It's a great shoreline species. It's stabilized. It has flowers. It's for pollinators. Um, and so we're just really excited that hopefully this will now have a chance to take over um, and we won't have primrose in this area again. Um, and we found that solarization works pretty well. Just the dry, hand, the dry land hand pulling does not work. So we spent some hours and staff pulling from that really hard rocky ground and it did, didn't do anything. A week later, stuff starts growing right back. Um, it's an invasive plant for a reason, it's hardcore. Um, so what we did is we followed up with some of the solarization fabric here to see um, if this, uh, this plot can then be solarized and if that would be effective there. And then we're trying some other areas that have a little more aquatic area, but really the solarization is great in this low water drought year. We would not be able to do this if it was a flooded year. We would, we would have to do something else, which we did. We did herbicide in previous years. You guys saw the results of that. And then all of these areas, we're going to follow up with tule plantings in the fall. So here's that area where the primrose started creeping back, right? So we can spend all the time pulling and treating, but if we don't have natives there to replace that space, it's not going to, it's not going to mean anything or do any good. Um, and so you can see here, we have some tulies. And what would probably happen is we're going to have to maintenance these areas for many years, go through and remove, hand remove some of this primrose to give the tulies those chance to come back or smart weed or whatever it is else that we're, we're planning there. If you are interested in solarizing, there's still a little bit of time left to solarize. So if you wanted to try it on your property, um, this is some of the details for that. I do want you to work closely with me because there are some rules for solarizing. You could do a lot of damage um, if, if you know, you're not following the rules. 
Um, but the first thing is just getting that manual permit. It's only $48 and that's to work with us to make sure what we're doing is, is um, the right thing to do and effective. And again, we have to make sure that there's 100% primrose coverage there. So you can do that by either having a site visit from me or submitting photos of the site where the solarization is gonna go. Um, and I can verify that it's just primrose there that you're covering. And again, know that this is experimental. There's no guarantees for this. So I'm not guaranteeing this is gonna be effective, but if it's something you wanna try based on our results, we can definitely work with you and do that. Um, and I would recommend, you know, you can either get solarization fabric from a garden store or just getting some heavy duty plastic garbage bags and some bricks and holding it down. That will work just fine as well. And we do recommend that there's follow-up either manual removal. So you go out and you weed if anything comes back in the next few years um, for spot treatments, or you get an herbicide treatment. The guys can come out and they could just, you know, spot treatment any little areas that come back. And for a few years, um, that's a good way to get things um, down to uh, eradication just right in your area. So you got to work on it fast though, because you want to get those out for four to five weeks. That means getting that's the permit set up and getting all your materials in September. So you're not um, having it go too much into October. If it gets too cold or rainy, it won't work. You got to take it up. And you can contact me to start this. If you want more information on that, you can put your email in the chat today. You can call me. Um, and uh, yeah, we would love to have some parcels if you want to experiment with this. We don't have any funds right now to do it for you. Um, but we can help consult. Um, and there is some groups around the lake that can, if you wanted to pay somebody to help you do that, we can connect you guys to do that work. And that is all I have. I do have time for question and answer, um, about five minutes, and then we'll do the poll for you guys. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that this is what we want our shorelines to look like. This is what it looked like for, you know, thousands of years. We have nice Thule wetlands, and then we have natives like the smartweed. Um, that we can use and it's a beneficial space. Um, and we want to prevent this from getting taken over um, by the primrose. And so this is what we're trying to do is remove the primrose and replace it um, and encourage and promote these kinds of shorelines here. So with that, I'll take any questions right now and then we'll go to the poll. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sally. And Daniela will unmute you got or do you want to you want to put questions there? If there's any questions in the chat box that I missed, you can also ask to be unmuted. I think. Uh, I don't know if you already answered it. Um, there's a question that asks. There's two that ask the same thing. Um, if an area is dry, is an herbicide permit required? Hmm. Yes, because it's still an aquatic plant. Technically, it's on the aquatic plant list, and it's in the lake bed. Um, and I've reached out to the Department of Pesticide Regulation. I have done my research to try to figure out if I could, you know, let you guys do a treatment without a permit. Um, and basically, they haven't thought that far, and they would rather not. <laughs> so they are not, they're not giving us the approval to do that, and I don't want to get in trouble by the state, um, and we don't want to do anything that could have impact. So um, we are, you know, we have the companies available to come out this month and do a treatment. Um, and we can work with you, you know, um, and, and work you through that, get that process, uh, be as pain-free as possible. Um, if it's in the lake bed and it's on aquatic plant on primrose, yes, you need a permit. Now, there are a lot of properties right now that are, um, have uh, 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 terrestrial weeds. So stuff is floated in like thistles and other things that are just growing because there's open space there, right? If it's not an aquatic plant, we, it's not covered under the um, uh, aquatic plant management permit system. So I can't off, you know, I can't do a permit for a terrestrial plant with a non-aquatic herbicide. That doesn't work. So you can, I know people are like weed whacking stuff. They're mowing. They're, some people are using, you know, they're just spraying some herbicide on some stuff that's a terrestrial, like a weed, like they're dandelions or something like that just happens to be on the lake bed. So that's a wishy-washy area um, because it is in the lake bed, but also we don't have ability to prove that because it's not an aquatic plant and it's not aquatic herbicide that you would be using on it, if that makes sense. It also won't be there next year because there'll be water there. <laughs> so yes. throw it down and Please wait don't. a year and you won't have to deal with it. <laughs> uh, 
Yes. Okay. So Donna got the permit. Yep. Polling's not effective. Yes. Yeah. And if you want to, you know, try to solarize, like ask your neighbors, if it's okay if you solarize a little bit, it's harder. If you just do your property, your neighbors don't do anything, it'll come right back. Um, but yes, the material needs to be weighted down on the permit. Yes. What you don't want is just the corners and then the wind comes and blows it up. The way solarization works is the black plastic particularly blocks out the light and it gets really hot and it fries it. Um, you know, even when it's not super hot out there, black plastic sitting in the sun is gonna bake what's ever under there. Um, and we've noticed it just like the day or two after we put solarization fabric, it already, it kind of smells like a bakery. It's already cooking that primrose tissue that's down there. Um, but that only works if the sides are very secure. So if you have any bricks, even flower pots, uh, even sandbags, anything you can put around there for the five weeks on the edge as much as possible to hold it down, particularly if there's winds, um, you know, even if you have a rake, if you have some boards, anything like that to hold the edges, that's what you want to do. Weed whack the target area, especially for most. Yeah, I would recommend weed whacking it. Um, you know, we have some treatments right now that we just weed whacked and then we put the fabric over it. We didn't remove the material. We also have some treatments where we weed whacked and then we remove the extra material. Um, I don't know yet which ones work better or which one doesn't. Um, if you have a smaller area and you can rake up the material that you weed whack, I bet that would be a lot better, um, more effective. Um, but I also think if you leave it out for the five, six weeks, even that tissue there, it'll still do a good job of, of getting it. But I definitely, before you put the fabric down as a weed whack, what you don't want is the fabric to get holes poked in it. Um, and then that will defeat the purpose. Yeah, exactly. Somebody said, don't want to poke any holes in the fabric. Exactly. So weed whack that. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? You can also put them in the chat or if you think later, you can email them to me. Let me put my email in the chat here. And then I also will have a poll started here in a moment. Um, and the poll is just important for us to get some feedback from you guys if this was useful. And if you have any comments for how we can improve or anything particularly you really liked, again, you can put them in the chat or email me. Um, and Daniela, you can do the poll here. And I think, yes, I think my email now in the chat. To answer all the questions. Donna, you had a question. Um, this is the water quality and the key safe to pull primrose. You know, the most recent results, there was um, the preliminary results came in and it's pretty, it, there's some, some areas of the keys were danger levels for cyanobacteria. So um, I would just wear gloves, wear long pants, you know, try to minimize exposure um, and, um, you know, be careful. We, that's what our staff did. We were pulling as we wore gloves. We were careful. We had lots of water to rinse off. We made sure we weren't out there for hours and hours. You know, we took breaks away from the site and that seemed to work. Um, the other thing is you can wait until it gets a little colder. If you want to wait a couple of weeks, it's been getting colder at night. That should lower the cyanobacteria concentration and that'll, um, and for the next results, you can see if it's, you can reach out and if it's lower than it is this time, it will be a little safer, I think. So hopefully that answered your question. Daniela, did the, all the polls get done? People are still responding, but. Okay, cool, I'll wait. Yeah. I hit the submit and it doesn't work. It might have gone through, it just won't um, let you know that it went through. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Any follow up? Um, we still want to do. Go ahead. Are we still on for September one, Lupioma Park? We are. Yep. Thank so we got you. it planned. We'll be there. Hope you did you want me to share the pool? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Donna. Because there's a shit ton of PVC. She addressed that with a super pollinator too, but it doesn't. From their studies in the past, like ten years. 
Awesome. So thank you guys so much. Let me know if you have any questions. If you have any other comments, you can put them in the chat. You can email them to me. Um, here is the phone number, 707-263-2344. Um, if I don't, if I'm not here in the office, I will return your call. You know, we are going to be doing some post-fire monitoring for cash fire. So we might be in and out of the office a lot um, more than we usually would be, but um, feel free to reach out, follow us on Facebook. And just, again, I really appreciate everybody uh, attending today. Thank you, Daniela, my moderator. Um, and I hope you guys have a great weekend and let me know if you have any other comments or questions. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys.